So with that, I'm going to hand off uh, to Carla Diana. Excellent. Well, uh, thanks, everyone. This is a really, really exciting day. And um, I uh, you know, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, design. Sometimes um, you know, in robotics, we uh, think about design much afterwards. But for me, it's really important that design is part of the process from the get-go. A little bit of my background, I'm originally trained as a mechanical engineer. Um, never knew that such a thing as industrial design existed, but really loved programming and tinkering, and went back to school for industrial design at a very kind of arty place. So I've had both sides of my brain very active. And uh, I've worked for a number of firms. Most recently, Smart Design I was at for five years. Um, many of you may know this peeler. It's quite ubiquitous. Um, my focus was always on physical things that had some kind of electronic component to them. And I um, was full time for many years working on client projects, but really felt like often the clients come for things that are very much grounded in today and what they know. And I felt very strongly that designers, we were starting to explore things, but in a consultancy model, you don't, you get paid for the hours that the client wants you to do. So I created this lab where we are exploring things that are to come so that designers feel like they have permission to tinker and think about what's next. And I pulled back and decided to focus a little bit more on my creative studio and future thinking and writing and speaking. And then I still maintain a relationship with smart design. So. Um, I do a lot of thinking in this space, as Eric mentioned. I've been doing some writing recently in the New York Times. Um, last week, this piece came out in the Atlantic. It's called The Dream of Intelligent Robot Friends. And I, I very much think of robots as either prosthetic or friend, somewhere on that continuum. So I'm going to show a few projects today that are very much on the friend side of the continuum. And the first one I want to talk about is Simon. And for me as a designer, I think of this really as the extreme of interface. So Simon is an upper torso humanoid robot project that's taking place at the Georgia Institute of Technology in the socially intelligent machine labs, machines lab that's run by Dr. Andrea Tomas. And um, I feel really fortunate, and this was really a formative project in my career, um, that Dr. Tamaz had uh, approached me and really wanted an industrial designer to be a core part of the main team from the very start of the project. There was myself, um, Dr. Tamaz, and Jonathan Holmes as mechanical engineer. And I was really the creative force around it. And my role was to ask the questions like, should it have ears, should it not have ears? Is it hair, is it helmet, um, and, and figure those things out and really think about what the human interface was going to look, feel like, and, and how it was going to be perceived. Um, so a little bit of background about the Simon Project. The Simon Project is um, it's a learning robot. So it has cameras in its eyes, has a microphone, and um, it has pads in its hands so it can grasp objects, it can be handed objects. And the entire intention of the project, and the reason I call it the extreme of interface, is um, that we're trying to study how we can interact with the machine in the most natural way possible. So can you hand it an object? Can you ask it a question? Can you gesture? Can you get its attention? Um, and can, and so th this is really ongoing. Um, and there is a team of PhD students specializing in the artificial intelligence of all of this behavior. And I maintain my relationship with them because I just really love this project and I love the work that's taking place. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, so Dr. Tomas had come from MIT Media Lab. So some of the precedents for the Simon Project were um, a socially aware robot by Dr. Cynthia Brazil called uh, Kismet. And um, after Kismet, Leonardo was developed. So Leonardo um, was developed because the team approached Will Vinton Studios, which is a very professional Hollywood studio, to develop the, what the extern, external look of this robot would be. And um, I don't know how many of you have, have seen this robot in person. 
A couple. It's kind of remarkable. I spent at least five minutes just kind of staring at its fingers. It has these little creases, very soft. Um, these are like lips and a nose made of leather. It's got eyelashes and yak hair. And it is a remarkable creature. And you can see how it would go from this to this, but take a giant leap. And what Dr. Tomas found, they did a lot of research with all kinds of people, including kids, and children would run screaming from the room. <laughs> and so, you know, talk about um, this uncanny valley, and, and she found that this was too creature-like. So um, that was my starting point. So I was really, I really had the benefit of being able to draw on her vast amount of knowledge. And so um, what I did is I started almost like an optometrist. It should be more like this and more like this. And we did user interviews with people on campus. And I also just you know, really drew on a lot of her knowledge and looked at kind of the spectrum of robots. And we wound up settling on this kind of friendly doll. And what we were really doing is managing expectations between the robot being a machine or being a creature. And from there, I did a lot of exploration, looking into you know, eye size and eye placement. We, you know, in different kinds of ears. Um, she had shared with me that the ears were most often used for expression more than any other feature. So we knew that ears were going to be really important. And then I did a lot of sketching and exploration and thinking about, you know, and, and talking about and going back to her and going back to some research and, you know, eventually kind of found these um, compromises between appliance and creature, and then started you know, fitting those to the robot. The body is actually created by a group here. It's called Mecha Robotics. Um, and so this is pretty close to what the final one was. It's an upper torso, so it doesn't have legs. So I'm always kind of struggling with this. How do we do, deal with a robot without legs? But you know, here's some of the exploration. We did 3D printing at scale. Um, we did a lot of. Um, 3D rendering. Originally, the robot was supposed to have lips and, and eyebrows, and they um, did not appear in the final robot, which is another part of my experience. Um, this is the robot being assembled, and this is what the final robot looks like. Um, this is a beautiful picture taken by Danny Rosen for the New York Times. And um, for me, the remarkable experience was meeting the robot the first time. And I felt this kind of odd feeling of like making a new friend, but there's this kind of incestuous thing. Like, this is my robot. I created this robot. And it's flirting with me. And what's going on? And, you know, because I had left it and it was in pieces. And I show up at the Kai conference in Atlanta. And here's this thing. And it's looking at me. And I swear it sees me. And um, here's a little bit about how the, the robot works. So we can um, take a look at this. There, there are subtitles here. So. Um, you say, Simon, take this, and Simon holds out a hand and says, sure. And what he's doing in this demo is actually recognizing color and learning color. So he holds it up, and you say, where does this go? And if, if Simon has seen the color before, he'll say it goes in the red bin. If he's not seen the color before, then he actually does this thing where he kind of shrugs his shoulders and goes, oh, I don't know. Um, and it's a little subtle in this first demo, but I may skip to the second demo, um, where you say, where does this go? And he says, I don't know. And um, again, it's this kind of a little bit clunky thing in the way that the robot moves, but just remarkable when you're there in front of it. And his ears kind of move a little bit. And um, you know, for me, as a designer, and we have a follow-up to this robot that's called um, Curie. Curie is the cousin of Simon. So I had a lot of interesting conversations like, what does the cousin look like? Does the cousin have the same ears or eyes? Um, but for me, the really magical thing are these little moments. So there was this thing in developing the Simon robot, which is that I said, you know, hey, can we put lights in the ears? And it really wasn't part of the original design. And Jonathan said, yeah, sure, we can certainly, you know, why not? Let's have another element of expression. And we didn't know what we would do with it. It wasn't really planned. I mean, that's what's really exciting about this kind of work, is it, it is pretty pioneering work. There isn't a lot of precedent. And where, the way that the um, robot was designed, uh, was programmed at first, 
was that it would change to be the color of the thing it was seeing. So this remarkable moment happens where instantaneously you and the robot are thinking about the same thing at the very same moment in time. You hand it this flower, you're thinking, oh, please, robot, please see the purple flower. And the robot does this thing, and it goes blink, and you go, yay, you saw the purple, we're thinking the same thing. And it's just magical. And as a product designer who does things like cell phones and cameras and washing machines, I felt like this is really the, the kind of thing I have to harness. And my vision is not that we have these talking, ro walking robots in our homes handing us beers, but more that we'll have like small bits of these experiences that show up when it's appropriate. So, um, you know, this is how it's going to be in our everyday lives. And as a designer, what's also very exciting is there's just so much that's new. When I started doing product design, this was pretty much what we had to choose from. We had buttons and dials, and we had what we would call the black rectangle. And now we have something kind of like this. So, you know, in the lab, I do a lot of experiments around studying color patterns now, and how do lights, if, are they chasing, are they pulsing, and, and what does that mean to people, and how can we create an entirely new vocabulary and language? You know, so I have these sort of this light box that I can put inside of a room and have it show the mood of the room, or you put it on your desk, and we have these RFID tags, and then we have a few other projects in the lab where you know, we can kind of broadcast what a person's mood is, and they can kind of change it, and then it gets updated online. Um, but what I wanted to show was how this kind of applies to a, a professional product for a client. So I, I worked on a floor cleaning robot at Smart Design. It was one of the clients there. And um, this was the uh, older design that was, existed and is in stores a lot today. And they wanted to do a new design. And I was so excited because I was coming from this background of having experience with academia and suddenly, you know, as, and especially at Georgia Tech, and there had been many papers that were written about the Roomba and the fact that the Roomba is not meant to be a social robot, yet people imparted all this emotion onto it and they saw it with a sock stuck under the bed and they felt, oh, the poor thing, it's stuck under the bed with a sock in its mouth. And, you know, and they, so there are all these studies about people kind of accepting the flaws of the Roomba. So, what I did is I really showed these to the CEO of the company, and we talked about developing a personality for the robot. And we looked at sort of typical service personalities, like a, um, a maid and a nanny, and we wound up actually saying it's much more complex than that. It's kind of like Gromit. Like Gromit is really smart, and he kind of knows a lot of stuff, he's really precise, but actually Wallace thinks he's the one that's in charge and doing everything. And, um, and what I did was, broke it down to identify some really critical moments in the experience, and then actually broke those things down into human language. Like, oh, hello, and there are good moments and there are bad moments. So when the robot finishes cleaning, it's done and it goes back to its base, and it can kind of like celebrate a little bit. And so um, I had the ability to have a team I, ha I worked with a graphic designer, and we talked about how it was going to appear um, visually. I also ha was able to hire a composer, and we composed a suite of sounds around the robot. And so we have these different kind of expressions, and the expressions can come through sound, light, and movement. And the vision for the new robot is that it will have an LED matrix of light that appears beneath the surface. So it's this kind of clean thing, and then it can be wiped down, but it suddenly comes to life. And it then has these amazing moments. Um, so uh, this is very much in the works. There's a, um, a new robot that's come out that has an LCD screen, but this LED panel is what we envisioned for the future. And I really got to work with the engineers, and this is more the vision of what it's going to be, and talk about every aspect of the behavior. So um, you know, I got to do a flow chart and talk about like what's the sound that it makes um, what's a message that appears? Is it a message or is it a facial expression? We have different rules for when that, what, when what should happen. And, you know, then we also can use movement. So if, it's, if it recognizes an obstruction, it can kind of do a little dance and back up. So th that's really the vocabulary I like to work with, is sound, light, and movement. And um, 
So then, uh, the, just in my last minute, as uh, Eric was mentioning, um, in my own studio, I decided, I was so excited about 3D printing that I wanted to do a book. So my book is called Leo the Maker Prince. And um, all the objects in the book, including the characters, can be 3D printed. And the reason why I wanted to talk about it in this context is because the robot's anatomy itself really has to tell a big story. Because what I realized was that a lot of people don't know what 3D printing is. So a lot of these are some of the early sketches for what Leo should be. But Leo's entire embodiment had to tell people at a glance what 3D printing is. So I knew he was going to have a nozzle. I knew he was going to have a spool of filament. And then like these drawings kind of show the gesture and the way that it interacts with the person. So we have this kind of tray. And the tray can take a drawing. The drawing can be scanned. And it goes above his head. And then his tail does this thing. So um, and this doesn't appear in the book. But I, I had to do this because I have like lots of Star Wars books of robots, and they look like this, and I wanted my robot to look like this, too. Um, but people all over the world are printing the objects, and I've been collecting the images, and there's even some fan fiction going on. So Leo can not only print in, print in plastic, but he can print in snow. So um, that's what I have for you today.